Good evening, everybody, and welcome to The Gathering Place. We're so glad that you could join us tonight. And what a beautiful night. We've had rain, um, rain throughout the last couple of days. We're going to have rain the next few days. And we're grateful for the rain because it's something that God promised us, something that he had to speak, and he never said that it was going to stop. So he hasn't spoken that. I believe that he is watering California, that the rain is a sign of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's coming upon California. And here's the thing that, that people um, are going to have to understand that, and you'll see it tonight as we go through some of these scriptures, that when God's glory or his spirit is poured out, it does a couple of things. It, it brings blessing and glory and healing, but it also brings judgment. And so God judges the darkness. I thought it was interesting that, um, and you know, I pray for Governor Newsom, as God told me to pray for him. The time he was elected, you know, politics couldn't be further apart, but he said, pray for him. But he was upset. He went to a, a Target or something, and somebody walked out with like $400 worth of merchandise. And he's like, why didn't anybody stop them? And the lady didn't know who he was, said, oh, it's the governor. <laughs> and he got, re- he got very upset. Then she realized who it was. Said, oh, can I have a picture? You know? And he goes, I want to talk to the manager. And not realizing that policies that have been made in Sacramento have opened the door for this massive theft. And all the stuff that's going on is causing areas, a lot of poor areas, um, where the, the shops are just, they're just they're closing up shop. They're saying, well, we, we don't want our employees to be hurt. And um, so we're just closing shop and we're, we're going to just go somewhere else. And so it was kind of like, it was kind of some judgment was brought directly to his face so that he could understand. Now, it didn't seem like he fully comprehended it, but maybe he will. So I'm praying for that to happen. But we are going to see judgments and listen, there's going to be judgments in California um, because that's part of the outpouring of the glory of God. We're going to see massive move of the Spirit, healings, miracles, but we're all going to, also going to see judgments because they both go hand in hand. And we'll see that as we get into the Word tonight. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. All right. So let's start by, always before, before we do an offering, I always like to go over some financial scriptures, and I'll put together just a, a bunch of passages that I like. It's kind of my personal memorization thing, and I did it for myself, but I thought, why not just kind of start going through one, a different one every week, and we've been going through them, and these are, these are <clears throat> the ones we've gone through in the last couple weeks. Proverbs 10, the blessing of the Lord, it makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Just a great passage. Isaiah 48, 17. This one is hard on those who, who just fight anything to do with kingdom prosperity. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teaches thee to profit, which leads thee by the way that thou shouldest go. Everybody wants to come to America because there's great prosperity in America, and there's great prosperity in America because it's a nation under God. A lot of leaders don't recognize that they don't understand it's the blessing of the Lord that has prospered this nation. But that realization is coming because God's people are crying out. Now listen, when God's people cry out, the deliverance isn't always instantaneous. You know, there was a prophet sent to Israel that prophesied God was going to raise somebody up to deliver Israel, and that was Gideon, but that was many years later that he was raised up to do it. So God will send prophets, prophets begin to prophesy things that are going to happen, When the time comes, it happens, and there's deliverance. There are things we're going to see in California. uh, There are judgments, and not just in California, but in our nation. We're going to see transformation. God is teaching his people to prosper and to profit. Uh, There have been demonic forces that have been fighting the people of God from prospering. And those things are going to be broken over the people of God. And when they're broken over the people of God, everybody prospers. You say, when Joseph had the wisdom of God to save Egypt, he didn't just save Egypt. He was meant to save Israel, but it saved Egypt and it saved all the neighboring countries. So everybody was blessed because of his wisdom. 
In Philippians 4.19 it says, But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That is another great one. If I was reading out of Proverbs, I would say, and I, I don't know why, um, there's certain books of the Bible that should just be like almost Christian mantras, like the Proverbs. Like we should just be going through that all the time. Christians are always fighting over finances. What, the richest kingdom, the richest guy that ever lived, it's right there. And it's the spirit of wisdom that's in the Proverbs. That, that is what created the richest kingdom that ever lived. People, well, God doesn't want you to have anything. Well, then he shouldn't have given Solomon wisdom. Because wisdom says in Proverbs 8, riches and honor are with me. Now, if you don't want riches and honor, don't engage wisdom. But I would say just engage wisdom because of all the blessings of wisdom in your life. But with that will come riches and honor. 3 John 2, Beloved, I pray above all things. I know it says wish in the King James, but I pray above all things. Thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prosper. We touched on that Saturday that not above some things, not above most things, above all things. So once your soul is in alignment with God, God wants his people to prosper. He wants the earth to prosper. He doesn't want the people to be in poverty. You know what happens when people are in poverty? They steal. They do all kinds of crazy things. That's not God's way. He said he'd open the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing. That's the rain, waters the crops, and people have abundance. Tonight, the scripture is Isaiah 119. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. The full passage reads like this. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. In other words, have, have judgment, true kingdom judgment. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Well, isn't that what Jesus did? Did he make our did he, he not only made them white as snow, he washed them away. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, what? To do these things. You shall eat the good of the land. Well, Jesus did most of these things for us. He's just saying, be a just person. Have justice. And as a nation, be a nation of just. Be a just nation. Arrest the criminals and celebrate the heroes. So what is America doing? We're arresting the heroes and celebrating the criminals. That's true. Think about the guy in New York that the guy was threatening all these people. He didn't mean to kill them, but he put him in a put him in a chokehold, and, and the guy ended up dying. But he was on their 50 most watched list in New York because he was creating all kinds of havoc, stabbing people, all kinds of things. Uh, so this guy stepped in, him and two other guys, to save people. And so now he's going on trial, whereas these four guys attacked police officers. They got out of jail and started flipping off the, uh, the United States of America. Celebrate the criminals. <laughs> Judge the just. That's not how things work. So I'm going to tell you right now, there is kingdom judgment that will be released on unjust officials. It always happens. Oh, they can go for a while, but it's going to happen. Now, in a sweeter vein, Kenneth Hagin is a great prophet. And the Lord, one of the times that he appeared to him in an open vision, and a lot of people don't realize how powerful that is to have an open vision. Because there's, listen, there are people, there are more people going to heaven than ever before. But there's some phony stuff too. But, but there are real people, that real prophets that have visitations. This is one of them. One of the things that Jesus told him, he spoke to him about finances. He said, he, he quoted him this scripture in Isaiah 119. He said, there are things that you have been obedient to me, but you haven't been willing. Like what? So he was obeying the Lord, but he didn't want to do it. So he was obedient, but he wasn't willing. So you want that new car, Marina? Just get willing 
Be obedient, willing. I'm telling you, I'm giving you a word from the Lord. Be willing and obedient. He's going to give you a new car. I know you just got a new car, but he says he's going to give you a new car. Maybe you want another new car. Okay, there we go. So he said, if you'll be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. But he said, he said he's going to give you a new car. Just be willing and obedient. And for Hagen, he was obedient, but he wasn't willing. So sometimes we have to get willing. Sometimes we do things we don't want to do. What do you do? Change your inward man to a place of willingness. It's really that simple. All right. With that, we are going to receive the offering this evening. So if you're making out checks, please make them out to the gathering place or those that give to Soaring Ministries, do that. Same thing, if you're texting, you can scroll down to either one. For those of you who couldn't make it tonight, man, what a beautiful Rodney just played, and it was just, the spirit of worship was here the whole night. We just sang in the Holy Spirit. At least I did. I think other people did too. I couldn't hear anybody over myself. But I love that. I love just worshiping the Lord like that. All right. Pray this prayer with me. Father in heaven, we bless your name tonight. We thank you for all the blessings of the United States of America. We thank you that you've called and sanctified this land. This land we're on right now. And the land of our nation. And the state of California. You have set us apart. For an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We are grateful for that. So we come to you. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. To bring our tithes and offerings. And we ask you as our high priest Jesus. To present our tithes and offerings. Unto our Father. Make it a sweet savor. Let it be an offering in righteousness. And Father, we humble ourselves by proving you in this way. We thank you today for the opening of the windows of heaven, pouring out the rain upon the state of California, filling up our water supplies, lots of snow in the mountains. We are grateful, Lord, for this blessing and this prosperity. We thank you for rebuking the devourer for our sakes. We thank you for the oil prices coming down. We thank you that interest rates are coming down. That inflation is coming down. And we also, Lord, thank you that you are rebuking the devourer of crime. For our sakes, that our governor saw it. And I believe a shift is coming. We thank you, Lord, that you're rebuking the devourer in our school systems. Amen. All right, let's just go ahead and receive the offering. Hey, we're hitting on everything. Now you what? What did we do? We started, we started rebuking crime. What happens? The governor, the governor of our state witnesses a crime in a target firsthand. And he's pretty upset about it. I think that opens the door for change. All right. So let's reiterate a couple of things. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. Um, We've really just been, we went through some of the scriptures in the New Testament. We've kind of been going through the book of Acts, just seeing how they operate and move with the Holy Spirit. And I just wanted to reiterate a couple of scriptures here from Acts 1 said, when they were assembled together with them, and this is Jesus, he commanded them, they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So he said, John, who had an inferior baptism, baptized with water, he goes, but I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit, not many days hence. When they therefore were come to, and, and, and by the way, I want you to look at this part here. 
He commanded them. It's not, it's not like a, a take it or leave it situation. He's not saying, hey, hey guys, you can take it or leave it, but I'm going to send the Holy Ghost. No, there's no take it or leave it. He commanded them. If you're fighting this, you're fighting the command of God. And I pray that those words I just said will gnaw at you and they will drill inside of you until you cannot stand it and you cry out for the baptism of the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And, you know, they wanted political change. Which, isn't that what everybody wants a lot of times? Political change. He said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. <clears throat> he said, That's not your concern. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You'll be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. So he said, You're going to have power when the Holy Ghost comes on you and you're going to be witnesses. So he's telling the early church, the most important thing you can do is to connect to the Holy Spirit. It's the number one thing to do. Not number two, not number three, number one. And we know this from 2 Corinthians 10. Matter of fact, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a quiz. I know you know that, and don't, don't doubt your answers, by the way, because you guys know this. So you have the ministry of the old and the ministry of the new. What are the three things of the ministry of the old out of 2 Corinthians chapter 10? Law, death, we'll just put con- condemnation. So that was the ministry of the old, but there was a glory in that ministry. It said that the glory was so strong that Moses' face was shining. But the problem is nobody could look at him. Why? Why? Because that glory condemned the sin that was in their lives. But isn't it interesting that Jesus, who had more glory, they could look at him. It's a different kind of glory, different kind of purpose. What is the ministry of the new? Holy Spirit and righteousness. So we know that We are to focus in on the Holy Spirit and on God's righteousness. Those are two areas that we should have a massive focus. And I want to say the greater one should be the Holy Spirit. Because he's a person. In Romans 8, verse 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. It doesn't say as many as are led by the voice of God. I like to hear the voice of God, don't you? But you know that most of the time what the voice of God is? It's the voice of the Holy Spirit. God the Father is on the throne. Jesus is at his right hand. But God the Holy Spirit is here with us. So a lot of times when we're hearing the voice of God, we're actually hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. Well, I heard the voice of God. I believe it. But it's more than likely the voice of God the Holy Spirit. Because he's the one that's sent to you. Now when the gifts of the Spirit are in operation, it says that all three, the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, are involved in the gifts of the Spirit for words of wisdom, knowledge, so on. But just your everyday leading, it says you're led by the Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit, number one, he's so awesome, he's so big, he's so massive in his, his ability to do things that he could, he could speak to If you multiplied every person on earth by a million, he could still intimately connect to every single one of them and speak to them. Because he he is limitless. Here's the interesting thing. If we were all in our glorified bodies, every single one of us right now, we could all speak to each other all at once. I remember what great prayer warrior he talked about, uh, Phil Halverson, he talked about God was, uh, took him into the heavenlies to show him about spiritual warfare. And he said the number one place of warfare on the earth was in Jerusalem. 
I think the number two was Washington, D.C. But he said he was taken up into the heavenlies, and he said he was there, and I don't know if it was 100 angels or more, but the angels were the army of God. And he said they all were communicating all together at once with each other. Wouldn't that be nice? You'd be, all, you know, you'd be having, having such capability. The truth is we were actually created with that capability, but Adam messed it up for us. So we have to say things like, don't interrupt me, you know, <laughs> but instead of all talking at once. But all the angels communicated at one time together. Well, that's how the Holy Spirit, he is able to communicate to every single one of us. He is able to be completely intimate with you and everybody else all at the same time. And, and you don't lose one iota of that intimacy. But what happened with the angels? Well, a big horde of the army of demons came and attacked them and he said, the, the battle was so vicious and so ferocious, there was smoke and just stuff everywhere. And he goes, surely no one could survive that battle. He said, but when the battle was over, he said, there were the angels of the Lord unscathed and they had won the battle. But he said, these hordes of the enemy, he goes, they were ferocious, they were wicked. Listen, demons, they get into battles because they think they can win, but they can't win but they think they can, or they are intimidated by spirits on a higher level. And they realize that they realize that complaining, it's easy to get people to complain, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, you say, and, and uh, you meet somebody in the supermarket, well, da, 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 and they complain about something. Well, the weather's bad, uh, the weather's too hot, uh, too, you know. That's how a lot of people connect. Uh, so people don't have, they don't understand faith. They don't understand the operation of faith like Jesus did. That's why he refused to say that Lazarus was dead when he was talking to his men. Well, they said, what's wrong with him? Well, he's sleeping. Oh, he'll be fine. So that you know, he's dead. He had to, he had to let them know, but he didn't want to. I mean, why didn't you just say, well, he's dead, and i got to go over there and pray for him. No, no. He said, so that you know. But why didn't he just tell him at first? Because that's not the language he spoke with. So we are led by someone who is intimate with us, who is in love with us, because God is love, right? Who can tell me this? How is the love of God shed abroad in our hearts? How is that? By the Holy Ghost. You guys are really smart. So, the love of God, Romans 5.5, 5, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who is given unto us. So, if the Holy Spirit is God, He is the Spirit of God. He is the Spirit of love. That, may, that means that He leads us by love. Now, sometimes love has to judge, but it never, it never rejoices in judgment. But sometimes it's necessary. We are led by love. We are led by the Spirit of God because we are the sons of God. And that's something, listen, that's something that, and I almost don't want to say it in this church because of the kind of people you are, but it's something that understanding who we are as sons of God is something that a majority of people in this generation will not understand. But future generations of Christians are going to understand just like they're going to understand their authority and dominion over death. Amen. Thank you for the one amen, Rodney. All right, let's move on. So we're going to go to Acts 13. Now they were in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers and pastors. <laughs> Did I misread? Where are the pastors at? Aren't pastors supposed to be running churches? That's funny that in the Bible, they never, there were never any pastors running churches. There were these other characters, apostles, prophets, teachers. So in the church, certain prophets and teachers, and now listen, there's churches you can walk in today where they're scholars and they're brilliant and they're smart people. But they're not prophets. They have nothing by revelation. And there's what I call aftermarket prophets. What's an aftermarket prophet? 
Well, after the car comes out of the factory, they say, hey, let's add this and this on it. In other words, after, after an event has happened, they'll say, oh, God did this because of this. That's what happened in the 94 earthquake. Kim Clement prophesied when it would come in the middle of January, the shaking, and that it was a shaking loose of the demonic influences. Uh, so what happens after the earthquake? Television evangelists are getting on there and prophesying, saying, well, God is judging the pornography in the San Fernando Valley. That, that, that's not what the prophet said beforehand. But that's what the aftermarket prophets were saying. So true prophets are saying it beforehand. And you're going to find that now. We're going to find out who the true prophets are. And Barnabas was one of them, Simeon, that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Ammonian, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. Saul was, of course, there. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said. Now, it doesn't say who he spoke through, but it said, the Holy Ghost said. It didn't say God the Father said. Why? Because God the Father generally isn't the one speaking. In the New Testament, Jesus said, I hear my Father's voice. He said, my sheep hear my voice, my Father's voice. But in the New Testament, you'll notice that when God was speaking, it was always the Holy Ghost. What if somebody said, God told me? I'm fine with that because I know what's actually going on. It's actually the Holy Ghost, but since He's God, I'm okay with it. Aren't you? But... If you want to be more accurate, say the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the thing. The Holy Spirit, He doesn't always speak the same way. Sometimes He leads. Sometimes He compels. Sometimes He clarifies. Sometimes He reveals. Sometimes He shows. There are many different ways in which He speaks, some of which we will get into. Sometimes it's through angels. I was... uh, Better not say that. Anyways. This had an interesting account... account, uh, I had an interesting meeting where I saw an angel and I saw what the angel was and when I spoke out what the angel was, it was that, what that person was. I didn't know them. I never, never, never met them. It's harder for me to do here because I've met you guys. But when I'm somewhere where nobody knows me, then it works. Okay. So the minister of the Lord and fast of the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work where unto I have called them. So they were, they were called together. Now, do you notice there were no apostles here at this point? But didn't Barnabas and Paul become apostles? This is where they, this is where they were called. Just because you're called to something doesn't mean you are that. Paul it was probably 17 years before he stepped out as an apostle. He was, he was separated 14 years from the church, another three years. He didn't just start ministering right away. God had to raise him up. He'd been raised up in the law all his life. God had to reveal to him what all the scriptures meant. And when he started out, he was still a little bit harsh. He was still a little bit legalistic. I mean, he rejected rejected, uh, John Mark. And him and Barnabas had a big old fight over it. And they separated ways. Even though they were called together, they were called to work together for God, they separated ways. Say, who the Holy Ghost with? Well, he went with both of them. So God was working with his second best will. His best will would have been for Paul and Barnabas to continue on together. But they didn't because they had a big fight because Paul was a little bit too legalistic, not Barnabas. Now, Paul did have to straighten Barnabas out when he, along with Peter, got themselves under the law. People came from, from Jerusalem, from James, they're practicing the law, and all of a sudden, Peter and Barnabas thought, we've got to, be, we've got to practice the law here. And, and Paul said, I was to him to the face. And he says, Barnabas was to be blamed because he was carried away with their, uh, with their hypocrisy. So it wasn't that Barnabas was always right, but they were a good combination because Barnabas was more somebody who could bring reconciliation. Paul was a little more, a little more legalistic at the time, but... As he grew, he grew out of that legalism. And later on, he said, John Mark is necessary for me. Which, by the way, John Mark wrote the book of Mark. So you could say, you can't say he was just some bum. Just, you know, some, some worthless disciple. No, he became a great, great man. Did a great work. 
the world um, will be forever grateful for the book that he wrote. Why did he write it? Was, was he with Jesus? Well, he wasn't one of the twelve. No, he was the young man that ran away. He said that they took the cloth and he ran away naked. That was him. But he was the disciple of Peter. All right. By the way, he was a disciple of Peter. By the way, Matthew and Luke used John Mark's writing as an outline for their writings. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that's why they're called the synoptic gospels because they're synonymous, but it was taken mostly from Mark's gospel. Of course, Matthew was writing to the Hebrews. Mark was writing more to the Romans. So let's continue on. When they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. They were sent by the Holy Ghost. People just do stuff now when they feel like it. If you're sent by the Holy Ghost, you're going to be okay. They departed into Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Let's move down a little bit. Same, same chapter, same book. One had gone through the aisle unto Paphos. They found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet. So there are false prophets. This guy was a sorcerer. False prophets aren't, listen, false prophets aren't wrong prophets or people who, who've missed it. They are people who operate under a false spirit. There are people, listen, there are people that operate under the Spirit of God, but they've missed it. They've made mistakes. But it doesn't mean they're a false prophet. It just means they've, made, they've missed it. In the Old Testament, there was a school of the prophets where literally they would train people up who were called as prophets. To do what? To be prophets. And so people, even if you're called, you don't just immediately become a prophet. Like I said, Paul was 14 years away from everybody, being trained up by God to be what? An apostle and a prophet. So it takes a little bit of training, takes some learning. So they come across this false prophet. He was a Jew. So he's acting as, he, as a prophet of Jehovah, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which, remember, Jesus is another word for Joshua. Very famous Old Testament name. Which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elamis, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, same guy, bar Jesus, he withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Try to turn away from Jesus. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost. What was he filled with? Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Set his eyes on him. And he said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. This wasn't just somebody who was off. This is somebody who's operating under an unholy spirit. Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Not just, he wasn't just saying, I don't believe in Christianity. He's perverting the right ways of the Lord. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now, this wasn't a healing. Like he didn't, he didn't convert him by healing, did he? No, this was, this was a judgment. There are some people that think that there's never any kind of judgment. I remember when I wrote, when I wrote, uh, I wrote an article, it's just in Facebook, because the Holy Spirit prompted me to. It's called Not Such a Smart Alec Now. And it had to do with Alec Baldwin. And it was, um, it was like several weeks after, because I didn't think a whole lot about it, but several weeks after, the Holy Spirit brings it to me. He said, 
This man mocked my servant, Donald Trump, for years. And he said, my grace has been lifted from him. That was a judgment. The grace was no longer on him. And there were a lot of Christians that were really upset with me about that. Oh, how could you say God? How could you say God would ever do that? Now listen. How could the Holy Ghost do this? How could blindness fall on this man? People think that people think that there's never any kind of judgment. Listen, mostly God judges the darkness by healing people. But there are people that are wicked. There are people that are evil in this world. And there are people that are there, they are knowingly playing with unclean spirits. They're knowingly doing it. This man was one of them. He was a sorcerer. And his sorcery was exposed, and he was judged. Now, his judgment was for a season. That means that the blindness would one day come off of him. And I'm believing that he recognized the, the goodness of God and cried out to God sometime during his blindness. That's my thought. Okay, this here is just, it's really, it's the whole long part of, of Acts 13, but I'm not going to read all of it. Paul stood up beckoning with his hands and said, Men of Israel, ye that fear God, give audience. So Paul, he gives this, he begins to teach and preach about Jesus. And as you come down toward the end, it says, And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God, not in the law. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. What is, what is blaspheming the Holy Spirit, by the way? It's, it's saying that the work of God is not the work of God. In other words, when the Holy Spirit is moving... Like if somebody's just preaching in their flesh, they're just some denominational preacher and they're just preaching from their head. There's no anointing, there's no glory, there's no presence of God. They may be sincere, but there's no presence of God there. You're safe. But when somebody is under the unction and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, there's an authority. I've had, that, I've had that authority come on me at times where I've went at people like right in the middle of a message. I mean, I went at them. It's authority. <laughs> that afterwards I'd go, what did I just do? <laughs> but I, I remember this one guy, we didn't know this. I didn't know at the time. It, he kept going in and out and in. He was disturbing the whole media and I was preaching. It was at Northridge Church. And... Um, I knew, if he, I knew if he came in again to, to, to disturb that I was going to have to say something. And he got right past the ushers. They just, they weren't paying attention. He just went past. And then, he's, and then it, now he's sitting in the row and he starts talking to somebody in the row while I'm preaching. I said, I said, excuse me. I said, you need to either sit down or, or to leave. Pretty nice. And he goes, I'm not doing anything until I, and he started telling me what he was going to do to this, this girl. I didn't realize it was his daughter. And all of a sudden, this authority rose up, and he said, you're not going to do anything, Dan! And I, just, and I jumped off the stage and went at him, and he ran for his life, <laughs> which was a smart thing to do. <laughs> but see there, I kind of like shouted, but that wasn't, it was an authority that came from somewhere else. That was like a shout, but it was a different, it was an authority that came there. Why? It was a judgment. Well, he'd been back there telling, you know, telling the ushers outside the doors, he was with a mob, and he had them killed, and he was threatening them and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> but once I went after him, the demons left. They were, the demons were afraid, and they left. And I found out there was this woman's father. <laughs> come to church. He invited him to come to church. <laughs> he got thrashed by the pastor. And um, so anyways, toward the end of the meeting, I, 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 I talked to her. I said, um, Sorry, I yelled at your friend, you know, and uh, she said, oh, it was my father. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. 
So I yelled at Father, and the ushers go, he's right back here. He'd snuck back in. He was sitting in the back. So I walked right over to him, and I walked up to him, and I led him to Christ. Once, a, once that authority was released, the demons that he trusted in to protect him, they were gone. And he submitted, and he gave his life to Christ. Amen. And, as a bonus, he got baptized in the Holy Ghost, spoke with tongues. Come on. All right. Ah, he said, you have judged yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. That's <laughs> kind of harsh. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. He goes, we're going to go to the Gentiles in the city. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region, but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. They were thrown out. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them. Well, Christians don't do that now. Why? Because they don't even know they have spiritual authority. Christians don't know they have spiritual authority. They would never wipe the dust off their feet. They don't even know what it means. We've, been, we've just been so secularized. I want to say the church in America has been so secularized that we just don't understand our authority whatsoever. It said the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Well, what is the kingdom? Righteous peace, joy, and the Holy Ghost. So they were filled with joy. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. As you can see, the Holy Ghost is moving in the early church in a powerful way. Now, this whole 15th chapter of the book of Acts, I just picked out one verse from it, but essentially there is a fight between the, um, the legalistic Jewish Christians and the non-legalistic. Well, there was a whole battle here that was going on, and so they... They believed, they were out preaching that people needed, when they were born again, they needed to be circumcised and follow the law. And Paul was saying, no, they don't need to be circumcised, they don't need to follow the law. You go to different letters that Paul wrote and see where some of the, he called them false brethren, sneaking in unawares. And so they have this whole hearing. Paul is there and Peter, and Peter's, he's on the side of Paul, and they're all giving their verdicts. And then... um, James stands up. James, the half-brother of Jesus, not the one that walked with Jesus. That, that James was murdered. And he says, you know, this is my verdict, that we should do this. He goes, hey, Moses and the law are preached everywhere, so we're good. So for these Gentiles, let's tell them don't, don't eat things strangled, things like that. And um, it said here, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. So what, what they're saying, what the writer, which is Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, what he's saying is that it was not necessary to lay a greater burden upon the Gentiles. In other words, they don't have to follow the law. Now, they made up a couple laws, don't eat things strangled, so on. But really, we're not under any law except the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and the commandment to love, believe on Jesus and love one another. That's really it. Um, <clears throat> but they were throwing some stuff out. Anyways, I thought this was a good scripture just to hit a little bit. So then we move on to Acts 16. How far are we going to go? Well, we'll just go for a little bit longer. We're not going to finish tonight, but we're, we're just moving on. Now when they had gone through uh, throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. So these guys, they knew the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now a lot of people are walking around going, I don't know what the, I don't know what the Lord wants me to do. I don't know what the Lord wants me to do. Listen, they weren't asking the Lord what he wanted them to do. They were, going, they were going somewhere to preach. 
They They weren't waiting for the Lord to tell them. But as they were going there, the Holy Ghost stopped them and said, no, 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 don't go there. So what we do a lot of times, we're waiting for, Holy Ghost, tell me, tell me to do something. And sometimes that's the right thing to do. But they weren't waiting on the Holy Ghost. They were just, they were going. But when they got, when they got there, the Holy Ghost said, no, 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 go, don't preach there. That's a little bit opposite of some of us spiritual Christians today. Sit around like, 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 you know, um, tell me what to do next. No. You don't need to wait for him to tell you what to do next. Yeah. You need a shower. Well, the Holy, <laughs> Holy Ghost hasn't told me. Well, I'm telling you. <laughs> you don't need the Holy Ghost to tell you to take a shower. Well, maybe you do, but I mean, mostly people don't. We don't need the Holy Ghost to tell us to do a lot of things. If you're hungry, you eat. If your car is empty, you put gas in it. You don't drive around and say, well, the Holy Ghost hasn't told me to put gas. No, he doesn't need to tell you that. You know that because you look at the gauge and it says empty. And honestly, it should say a quarter. It should never go as low as empty. You know a funny story? Just a couple of years ago, we were telling Kaylee, Kim and I both, you need to not let your tank go below a quarter. And what she do, she let her tank go down and, Dad, I don't have any, can you give me gas money? She had a job, but she's, all, you know, when you're youngest, they're spoiled, you're going to give them some gas money. And so, the night we're talking to her, Kaylee, do not let your tank go below a quarter. Okay, well. And then Kim goes, well, what happens if you run out of gas and you're on the freeway? That won't happen. So the next night, I'm out getting gas in my car, and Kim calls me. Kitty's out on the freeway, and if she ran out of gas, she's not stalled on the freeway. I said, I, I said, all right, I'll find her. Thankfully, one of those highway patrols came by, and they put some gas in her car. I met her at a gas station, but what happened? She went to a gas station, and some homeless guy was there or something, and, and he was like knocking on her window. She didn't want to get out, so she took off. And um, she ended up running out of gas. I told her, never let your tank go below a quarter. So that was the Holy Ghost giving her some instruction that she didn't obey, and so she ran out of gas. All right. Verse 7. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Oh, too bad they weren't listening to God. Because they wouldn't have made two mistakes in a row. Who do they think they are? The apostles that wrote the New Testament? Listen, it's easy to get religious. It's easy to get real spiritual. Only do what God will tell me. Well, that's good. I mean, that's a good attitude. That's my attitude. But God doesn't have to tell me everything. He doesn't tell me where to go eat after church on Saturday. <laughs> Whoever I'm going with, we'll sit there and we'll discuss it and we'll figure out a place that we all agree on. <clears throat> Several people go, oh, I was, you know... Oh, I was sick last time I ate there. Okay, we're not going to go there. Don't you ask the Holy Ghost? No, why would I ask the Holy Ghost? I'm asking my stomach, where do you want to go? <laughs> so you're being silly, Bob. Now listen, Paul went two different places and the people he were with, like he wasn't alone. He wasn't like just him by himself. Like he had a, he had a company of people with him. He had this whole company of people and he's walking around they get one place, no, don't go there. Get to another place, no, don't go there. When, you know what I would have said? Well, it would have been nice if you told me before I got here. Uh, that's what I would have said. But Paul didn't say that. You know, last week, and it wasn't, I didn't think it was that funny at the time. I get to the train station. I'm sitting there waiting. And on a train... Canceled. Mudslide. 
call an Uber, head back home. And I just, I said, you know, and you know, you, so you're getting ready, you get all your preparation, you're doing all this stuff, you're ready to go. And then I know I'm going to have to get up like super early on Saturday and drive down. I'm like, I was slightly annoyed, but not overly, but slightly. And, and so the next day, Friday, I said, Holy Spirit, why didn't you show me? And he goes, didn't you have an epiphany yesterday over something? I go, I did. I had a life-changing epiphany. That you're right. He goes, had you driven? Because if I'd known there was a mudslide, I'd have just driven. Had you driven or had you gone, you would not have had that epiphany. And I'm like, ah. so you just kept it from me. There's always a reason. The Holy Spirit doesn't tell you everything. He doesn't show you everything. But he gives you what you need. And when these guys got there, they're already walking. They're already traveling. Nope, don't go there. If I'm Paul, I'm probably a little bit annoyed. So I said they're passing by. You guys still with me? You got another two minutes? We'll finish with this story. And they passing by Messiah came down to Troas and a vision, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. So he had a vision of the night. It's one of the highest level visions. It's not an open vision, but it's close to that. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. So they didn't know where to go. They didn't know what to do. They're walking around, kept here. Every time they get somewhere, the Holy Ghost said, nope, not here. Nope, not here. But then Paul has a vision. After he had seen the vision, immediately he endeavored to go into Macedonia, shortly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. I didn't tell him where to go in Macedonia. He just said, go to Macedonia. So I believe the Spirit gave him the vision. But you have to understand, we're not, we're not like this. Go right. We're not waiting for the very next thing, for the Holy Spirit to tell us. But you know what I am? When he talks to me, or when he speaks to me, I react quickly. Now, a lot of times he talks to me when I'm not interested. In other words, in other words I didn't want him to say that to me. Like he might say something to me, I'm like, but it's too late, I've already heard it. It's like, I didn't want you to say that to me. I wanted you to say this to me. I want, God to say, I want God to say the things that I want to hear to me, but he doesn't always say the things I want to hear to me. Some people get things in their head and they think, they, they think that I can only hear the... They get something in their mind that they want to do and they're waiting and they're trying to figure out a way to get God to say it. Uh, and they'll almost, they'll almost hear it from anything. I felt like God wanted me to do this, and I saw a commercial on television. You know, it's like, <laughs> no. When the Holy Spirit speaks, it's like it's like fasting. I know Paul was in fasting oft, and we should fast from time to time, just no matter what. Good for you, uh, physically. Good for your health overall. But I won't do a long fast until the Holy Spirit says it. But I don't know what He's going to say. It. That's the problem. The last time he told me to, to do a longer fast was like, I want you to fast 14 days. <laughs> but it was too late, I already heard it. Like he didn't give me any prep time. Like he didn't prep to me, in four days I want you to fast for 14 days. And it was like, now. So what do we do? We walk around, pray, pray. I don't, need the, I don't need the Holy Spirit. You know, I don't sit there and open my Bible and go. I have certain things that I focus in on. But the Holy Spirit might guide me or might direct me or might change me. That's fine. He can do that. As Kenneth Hagin used to say, you can tell as much about what the Holy Spirit is saying by what he doesn't say. 
If somebody says, invites me, hey, Bob, can you come speak here? I don't have to say, well, let me go pray about it for three days. I don't need to do that. But if the Spirit quickens me, well, I'm not supposed to go there. Then, no, no, I can't go right now. But if he doesn't, I'm going. Why? Because he didn't tell me not to go. Now, if you're like Balaam, God told Balaam not to go, and he asked him two more times. Not a good idea. Are you, are you catching what I'm saying? We over-spiritualize things to our own detriment, and instead of just doing things, sometimes God just puts a desire in your heart. Like he just gives you desire, and the desire leads you, and the desire drives you. And unless he, unless he just quickens you, don't go that way. Now here, here's something else, too, that you may not like. Sometimes the Holy Spirit leads you into a situation <laughs> that's not good. And you're like, no, I was trying to follow God and I end up in this bad situation. No, he led you into a battle because he needed you to win that battle. He needed you to, he needed you to fight a fight, so he led you into a battle that you didn't want. But if he led you into a battle, that means you can win the battle. Do you think Jesus wanted to go fast for 40 days? I mean, he's 30 years old. He never fasted 40 days all his life. I'm pretty sure about that. Hmm, I'm going to go fast in the desert for 40 days. Sounds pretty good. I like that. No, he didn't like it. You think he wanted to do that? No. You think he was having fun out there with the lizards and whatever else? No. But he was out there fulfilling his destiny. And the Spirit led him. Well, the Spirit didn't lead him until the Spirit came upon him. Then the Spirit led him. There's so many instances in the Bible that you could just show this stuff. Like when Jesus went to the fig tree. He wasn't led by the Spirit to go to that fig tree. It said he was hungry. He was led by his hunger. No, Jesus, everything he only did with the Father, only the Father showed him, Bob. No, when he prayed in the morning, he saw the character and the nature of the Father, and that's what he did. He didn't know that woman was coming up behind him to grab his garment to be healed. He didn't know that. He didn't know the centurion was going to say, no, you don't need to come to my house. Just say the word. He was surprised by that. Just as he was angry when he got to the fig tree and there was nothing to eat. So when you're walking around, some of what you're walking around is just from your own will and who you are. And God leads you when he needs you to do things. He directs you. He doesn't direct me what to eat for breakfast every morning. But once he's given me something that works for me, I might do that every morning. He doesn't have to continually say that to me every day. You understand? I'm just not that stupid. Well, I'm not sure about that. Uh, anyways, maybe, maybe not. All right, I said that would be it. <sighs> Did you guys learn something tonight? Yes. Yeah, it kind of took a little, takes a little pressure off you. It's like, oh, okay. So I just have to just keep seeking God and praying and and, and walking with him, and he'll speak to me as he needs to. And when he speaks to me, I'll do what he says. When he speaks to me, I'll do what he says. Does he speak to you a lot? He, gives me, he does a lot of little things with me. I don't talk about it much, but he does. Leads me a lot, guides me a lot. Little, it could be little things. But you know, if you have an intimate relation with somebody, you don't go walk around talking about everything about it. Do you? Unless you want the other partner to go, hey, shut your mouth. No. You have an intimate relationship with God. He's leading you. He's guiding you. But he also has given you a free will. He's given you a mind. He's given you thought processes. He's given you abilities. And so you don't need to 
ask him about every little thing. But if you're praying and you're sensitive, whenever he does prod you, then go with the prodding. All right. Let's pray and then maybe we'll have some fun together after we go off air. So I should always come to the meetings, not just watch them. Father, I pray that you would grant everybody grace. I pray that you would grant everybody understanding of the Holy Spirit, who he is, how he operates, how they can walk closer with him. Give us a hunger for the Holy Spirit like you did with Catherine Coleman, Father. Father, we pray for grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your great grace, your abundant grace. Give us grace this week, Father. And I pray for your kingdom, your righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit be with us. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.